It was dark. I half woke. My mother was sitting up in bed, and I sleepily wondered why. I nearly slept again. Suddenly, there was a great crash as of falling wood, then a sound of quickly running feet and of voices calling and of a great deal of wood thrown hither and thither. My mother sprang up with a half-suppressed cry and ran away from me into the dark. I sat up, my heart beating with fright. Mother! I called. I was so frightened that I could hardly speak. What was going on outdoors? Mother! Mother! I repeated. I jumped to my feet and ran to the outer door of the house. It was open. I caught hold of it and, trembling, peered outdoors. There was a very faint starlight. I could hear indistinct noises. Somebody ran swiftly by the door in the darkness. I heard someone else plunge in another direction. It seemed as if the big faggot pile had been thrown down. I could not see its top against the sky. There were no more sounds. I waited and shivered and cried silently. Oh, father, father! I sobbed quietly to myself. Something dreadful must have happened. I stepped silently outside. Trembling, I walked noiselessly toward the faggot heap till I found myself stumbling over faggots. They were scattered far and wide. I dared not make a sound. I went back to the house and stood at the door. Where had my mother gone? Had the men killed my father? Was my mother dead, too? I did not dare to shut the door, for it seemed to me that somebody might have entered the house while I had walked toward the faggot heap. I looked at the dark back of me in the room and fancied I heard someone move in the blackness. By and by, two figures came toward me from the outer darkness. I shrank back as the two entered the room. Editha, whispered a voice. It was my mother. She fastened the door, hurried me silently into my day clothing, forbade my speaking, and then moved about, evidently putting some things into a bag. I could feel someone else moving about the room. I knew it was my aunt. But the two women did not say anything. After a while, my aunt kissed me, and then my mother took my hand and led me outdoors. My aunt shut the door behind us, and mother and I set off in the dark, she carrying the bag and holding my hand. I did not dare to talk. I could only wonder, as we went softly on, where we were going. Once, we passed over what seemed to be a very shallow stream. My mother lifted me across. And then we went on as before, only I helped her carry the bag. And so... We walked a long time till we hid near some bushes, and Mother gave me something to eat out of the bag. It was nearly morning. Are we going to walk all day, Mother? I whispered. No, she answered. We will not walk any more till night. And when night came again, we did walk a long way till we came to a thicket and a wall where we hid in the dark. All about us in the field was a multitude of white spots that, as sunrise drew near, turned into sheep. There were so many sheep, more than I had ever seen before. But I was so sleepy and tired, that as I lay with my head in my mother's lap, I saw the sheep less and less. And by and by, not at all. 
for I slept soundly. When I awoke, mother was sitting yet, with widely open, tired, watchful eyes, and one of the sheep was eating grass not far from us. I watched the creature's movements with great delight, till I was more awake, and then I remembered about father. Where is father, mother? I asked. She looked at me. Do not talk, Editha, she whispered. Someone might be on the other side of the wall and might hear us. So hushed, I tried to keep quiet through the morning, though indeed it seemed a long time to have to stay in a thicket and not talk. If it had not been for the many sheep, I do not know how I could have passed the time. There was one lamb that came near the thicket. I tried to have the creature allow me to pat it, but the lamb was as mild as its mother and would by no means trust to my friendship. And as I looked at my mother and found her always sitting, white-faced and anxious-eyed, I felt more and more worried about my father. Why did he not come? I lost interest in the sheep, and at last I sat listening as my mother had set me the example of doing. It was afternoon when I dared again ask mother my early morning question. Mother, I whispered, noting the drawn look of her face and the fear of her manner. Where is father? Perhaps we shall know before long, she answered under her breath. We stayed there all day. Toward evening, my mother broke forth in agony. Oh, Editha, Editha, she begged, pray for father. He said he would come here if we were alive. I prayed to the saints for him all night, and we came here and did not find him. I was so in hopes that he would be here before we came, and now all day has gone by and he is not here. Oh, Editha, do you know how to pray to the Lord Christ himself? Did Father teach you how? I am afraid Father would not like to have me pray to the saints for him, but I could not help it. Can you pray to the Lord Christ, Editha? My poor mother, she was sobbing. She sobbed so that I could hardly put my childish petition into words as I knelt beside her in the thicket. But she heard some of the words that I said, and she sobbed them over and over again, praying the Lord to send my father safely to us. And this, I think, was the first time my mother ever prayed, save to the Virgin and the saints. That night, my mother gave me something more to eat out of the bag and got some water from a brook. And then, once more, the darkness came, and the sheep turned to white spots in the field. And I was sleepy, and I prayed the Lord's Prayer in English, and went to sleep. I half woke once in the night, and I heard my mother whisper, Lord Christ, if thou wilt send my husband back to me, I will pray to thee, and not to the saints, all the rest of my life. Then I slept more soundly, and heard nothing, till I woke once more and found my mother sitting with widely open, tired, watchful eyes, and the white spots in the field had all turned to sheep again, for the sun was rising. Mother gave me some bread, and we stayed still among the bushes. Once in a while, we heard a sound, and Mother seemed to hold her breath to listen. 
Then, perhaps the sheep that had made the sound would come in sight, and Mother would lean back farther among the bushes. But toward evening, we heard a noise the other side of the wall. Mother turned very pale. She motioned me to be still. But a man jumped over the wall, and as I saw his face, I sprang up and ran, forgetting all caution in my joy. Oh, father, father, I cried. He ran toward me and caught me in his arms. A moment more, and we were all three hidden among the bushes, my mother sobbing, and my father's arms around us both. It seemed as though my mother could never stop crying. To think that father had escaped the men after all. I had been almost asleep in the hole among the faggots, my father told us, when I thought I heard a noise of someone coming softly up the pile. I thought perhaps it was one of you, though why you came I could not tell. I felt that someone climbed to the top of the pile and moved some faggots, and I thought I saw a man's head between me and the sky. I felt an arm reach down and grasp me, and I sprang up and grappled with the man, and we struggled hither and yon, and knocked down a great many faggots. And another man came, and I ran, and they after, but in the dark, I escaped, and I have come a long, roundabout road hither. The worst thing was, I feared I should not find you here. I was so long coming, and I dreaded lest ill should befall you, lest you should not dare to wait here. And my mother, who had wept through all his words, sobbed still as she answered, Oh, Ralph, Ralph, we prayed to the Lord Christ for you. Oh, Ralph, I feared you were dead. My father wept somewhat himself. Then he looked in our bag, and we all ate something, and my father repeated some words from the New Testament because it was too dark to see to read in the book. I was so glad he had saved the New Testament and not been obliged to leave it behind. My father prayed in English, and so did my mother and I. And again, the sheep turned to white spots in the field, and again I slept. But... I think that this time my mother slept too, for she knew that though homeless, we were all together. Her greatest anxiety was gone. As I was going to sleep, or when I was awake a moment in the night, I had a fleeting remembrance of the story that father had told us about those publicans who years ago were thrust out into English fields to die of cold and hunger. And I remembered that he had said that such people were not called publicans now, but were called Anabaptists, and that neighbor Eld had been an Anabaptist, and that he himself was one. Supposing we had to die in the fields like those publicans. I do not care, I thought sleepily as I reached out my hand and felt father's hand lying near me. I am going to be an Anabaptist too, just like father. Then, without realizing what such a resolution meant, I went to sleep again. From what my father and mother whispered to each other very early the next morning, when I was half awake on my father's shoulder, I learned 
that my aunt would doubtless be much relieved to have such dangerous persons as my father and my mother safely away from the village. Sorry as my aunt might be for us, we were a constant menace to her hold on the favor of the priests and to her consequent security. She might go on pilgrimages and might give tithes, but if she continually came to see and be friendly with a family suspected of heresy, how should she be safe? With us away, she could make her peace with the priests. She, perhaps, might be able to save a little of what we left behind us, and if a time of religious freedom ever came to England, perhaps we might go back home. But that would not be yet. And then I awoke more fully to realize what that meant. Shall I never see Stephen any more? I asked, ready to cry at the loss of my daily companion, the one with whom I had been brought up and whom I loved as I might have loved a brother. Shall I never see Stephen again? My father soothed me quietly. I hope you will, Editha, he replied, but not now. Before it was quite light, my father left us, for he was going to try and find a man he knew, one who bore on his cheek the branded mark accorded to him once as a gospeler. The man often came this way, my father told us, and could guide us or tell us the way to a certain farmhouse where the good man and his wife both read the New Testament and believed it so much that they would hide us from the priests for a day or two. And then, after that, my father thought we must try to find our way to the seacoast and out of England. It was almost nighttime again before father came back to us. Mother had become quite worried, lest he had fallen into evil hands after all. But he had not. Only he had tried to be so cautious that the errand had taken him a long time. He knew the way to the farmhouse now, and after dusk we thankfully followed him through the fields till we came at last to the home we sought where the good man and his wife welcomed us most heartily. God's people are one family in evil times like these, said the good man's wife. I crave shelter, but for a few days, answered my father gratefully. We are going over the sea. The next evening, a thing came to pass which impressed me very much. The gospeler? who had directed my father to our place of refuge, came himself there, and when it was nearly dusk, went with us to a little stream a short distance from the farmhouse. There, the gospeler baptized my father and my mother, for my mother had entreated that she might also be baptized. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has forgiven me of my sins, she affirmed. And truly, I think that always after that agonized night of watching in the thicket beside the wall, my mother was a changed woman. Never again did she seem to doubt or waver, and never afterward did she pray to the Virgin or to the saints. In the blackness of that night, her soul's eyes had been opened. The gospeler believed now that she was a Christian, and he granted her wish for baptism. I stood with the good man and his wife on the edge of the little stream and saw through the shadows the gospeler baptize my father and my mother. An awe came over my spirit. I took hold of the goodman's wife's hand, and she pressed mine, and we were still. The branded-cheeked gospeler came up out of the water with my father and my mother. 
I should never forget it. Never. I was the more impressed by it, because my father, before I went to sleep that night, explained to me that while baptism does not save one's soul, still the ordinances of Christ's appointing. And each of his followers should go at his command down into a burial in the water and rise again to a new life. I understood it all very clearly. And I also understood my father's explanation when he told me that I was yet really unbaptized. For that was no baptism which the priest had given me when I was a baby, since the New Testament tells us to believe and be baptized. And I could not have believed first, being an infant. Ah, my child, do you know what it is to believe in the Lord Jesus, now that you are old enough to do so? Asked my father. Not till you do that, Editha. Not till you have peace with God, through knowing that Jesus has forgiven you all your sins, will you be ready to be baptized. Do not trust that the water of your infant baptism can save your soul, Editha. Had I known what I know now, I would not have allowed the priest to put you in the water 14 years ago. The end of chapter 9